to have such talent in the church is a true blessing. It really is. And I don't know why that talent just sticks in one family. Not really. There, there are others who are talented in our church as well, and that is okay. Talent does not always mean you are musical. <laughs> I sing by letter. Open up and let her fly. That's all I know what I do. Well, take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 will be in verses 7 to 10 as Paul gives us a short introduction to spiritual gifts that are mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 to this church at Ephesus. So I've entitled this because I am so good with titles, Introduction to Spiritual Gifts. And I'm just repeating what the apostle would have said. Verses 7 to 10. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he first also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who, is, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Let's ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, thank you for this passage. It gives us a glimpse into the heart, not only of the Apostle Paul, but into the heart of the Holy Spirit that you have given to live in us. And I pray this will become clearer as not only we deal with this today, but in future. But thank you for this passage. Help us understand it today. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As I stated in earlier sermons, this section that we're in now in chapter 4 through the end of the letter has to do with how to use what was written to the church in chapters 1 to 3. It's one thing to know or to have information. It's another thing to know what to do with it. And I think in our language today, we would call one of those things understanding and the other we would call wisdom. Because if you look at a nut that goes on a bolt, if you're careful, you can look at the threads, how they turn and tell whether it's right or left-handed. Now, I've been in this country, America, for 69 years, 69 and a half years, and I realize that you can't tell the difference in metric, but you can with those. It's common, what we would call common sense, and Paul is now in the common sense part of this letter. He now comes to the subject of spiritual gifts, and this list is by no means comprehensive. There are other places, other letters that mention more gifts than this letter. But Paul is talking to this church, so verses 7 to 10 form an introduction to the gifts mentioned by the apostle to this church in Ephesus. Now, if you remember in the former verses, the apostle has stressed unity in the church. And we've talked about that several times. But now he begins to show how this unity brings out the best in individuals. Do not forget that. You have unity in the church, but the church is made up of individuals. In verse 7 he says, to each one of us grace was given. Spiritual gifts are given to the individual, but they benefit the church. That's why they're given. You say, well, why give gifts to the church? Well, because the body of Christ is made up of many members, but functions as a unit. Did you get that? If you didn't, let me say it again. The body of Christ is made up of many members, but functions as a unit, an individual unit. So when we say the church, we're talking about a church. Sometimes we're talking about the church all over the world. So we each need to know our place in the body so that 
as individuals, we can help the body do its job. Few parts of our body have no reason for existence. Now, doctors might tell you different. But in the church, church members sometimes act like the body does not need them. Those are the ones that aren't here today. Some are sick. Some are not able to come. Others have better things to do. But, but the th that's not true. The church needs every member. Every member. Some parts are taken for granted. Like your big toe. You know why we call it a big toe? Because it's bigger than the other ones. And it has a function. And if, you, if you've ever hurt your toe, your big toe, you know what that function is. It helps you keep your balance. Forward and backward. Not so much side to side, but forward and backward. Or nose hairs. We may not want to talk about that, but nose hairs have a function. They keep debris from getting into your lungs. Or the earlobe. Ladies, what would you do without the earlobe? You wouldn't have anything to poke a hole through, would you? No. Every part of our body is needful and necessary. And that appeal applies to the church also. So Paul introduces the source the means and the objective for giving gifts to men in this passage. And I pray at the end of our time we will be very grateful for how God has gifted the church. Not grateful to men who have the gift, but great, grateful to God who gives the gifts. So let us consider what I just said, the source, the means, and the objective for spiritual gifts in the church. You will never look at each other the same when you see how God has gifted them. Now let me say this before I get into the main part of my sermon. Sometimes when a person or a family joins the church and they are retired, the, the man or the woman might have been an executive in the banking system. And immediately we think when someone like that joins, well, they could take care of our finances. Folks, that may not be their spiritual gift. Gifts sometimes follow natural talents, but they do not have to. I hope that's clear. Sometimes that happens in a church where the person joins that's got this kind of background. Well, they can really help us in this area. That may not be their spiritual gift. They can help. But what is their gift? What is the Spirit of God supernaturally endowed for them to be able to do? Supernaturally. If you know anything about me, other than when I stand in this pulpit, you know that I don't talk a lot when I'm by myself. I don't have anything to say to me. It's when I have something to say, like this morning. And you could, I think I mentioned this to you before, you could ask some of the folks I went to high school with, did you ever think that Keith Jones would be a preacher? And when they finished laughing, they could give you their answer. So not everyone that has a natural talent does it mean that that is their spiritual gift. Yes, God can use people with natural talents and sometimes piggybacks off of that, but not always. What is amazing to me is when he uses someone that apparently has no leaning towards a certain area to be gifted in that area. That's supernatural. That doesn't happen in the natural realm. But let's, let's, let's look at these three ideas. Consider the means of spiritual gifts. The means in verses 7, the very first part of verse 7. How are spiritual gifts given to the individual? How do you get gifted? Well, first of all, you have to be born again. You're not going to get a spiritual gift if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Just wanted to make sure you understood that. But grace is the means. Grace. Grace is given so that we might exercise our gifts for the church. 
It starts with grace. Matter of fact, I think the Christian life starts with grace and ends with grace. Spiritual gifts are channeled to by grace, to each person by grace. That means God supernaturally gifts his children. It's supernatural. And I know some of you aren't, aren't convinced about that. I hope you will be when we finish. As I mentioned before, a person who works in the bank might not be gifted to handle finances in the church. They can do it. But some of the interesting things that I have learned through my life as a follower of Jesus Christ about spiritual gifts are these. When you are gifted to do a certain thing, you don't know the meaning of the word stop. You can go on, that gift, when it's being exercised, you can do that and not get weary. You guys think, when I say you guys, I'm talking ladies and men. You guys think that I am worn out after 40 minutes of preaching. In previous churches, I preached over an hour. Now, I will promise you, when I got home, I took a nap. Because it will wear you out. But you just seemingly, because you're gifted by the Holy Spirit to do that, you can go on and on and on with that. And it doesn't tire you out. Or a person who teaches high school might not be gifted to teach in the church. Just because they teach at school does not mean that's their spiritual gift. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Or a person who is a paramedic might not have the spiritual gift of mercy. They might do it because it's their job. Period. Now any of these can be an indication of spiritual gift, but they don't have to be an indication of a spiritual gift. Paul goes on and says we're given grace in proportion to the gifts we are given. All gifts. All of them. The ones here in Ephesians, the ones mentioned in Romans, the ones mentioned in 1 Corinthians are operated according to the grace of God. God gifts the church so that men and women can work together to follow a cause. Paul told the church at Corinth, you can desire better gifts. Yeah, you can. That doesn't mean you're going to get what you want, but you can desire them because the Spirit gives gifts according to the will of God. If you are gifted in a certain area, and you'll know what that is, I think, then that is supernatural. That's God gave you that. That's not something you were born with, something that you came up with, something you decided to do. And the thing is, we should pray for more grace so that our giftedness might do what it's supposed to do, and that is glorify God even more. So, that's the source. Grace, the grace of God is the source. But let's go on. Number two, consider the source of spiritual gifts. In verse, the last part of verse 7 and verse 9. Now see, in this passage, Paul quotes from Psalm 68, verse 18. And I'm going to read that to you. You have ascended on high. As a matter of fact, it's on the screen if you can read it. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. You see, this picture in Psalm 66, verse 18, is a picture of a victorious king ascending the mountain of the Lord in triumphal procession attended by a long train of captives receiving tribute from his new subjects and bestowing tribute upon the crowds that line that processional line. So says F.F. F. Bruce in his commentary. It's the picture of a victorious king going up to the mountain of the Lord. He's got captives behind him that he has captured in a battle and he's going up and he is bestowing gifts but gifts are also being given to him. But Paul doesn't worry about the ones given to the king. He talks about the ones the king gives to his subjects. He concentrates on the giving of gifts to the subject. Now see, even though the king 
the victorious king gets gifts from his subjects, Paul wants the church to know that Jesus was given gifts by his father, and what does he do with those? He gives them to us. And we'll talk about how that works together. It is worth noting in this passage that all three members of the Trinitarian Godhead are involved in this. We call these gifts of the Spirit, but that's because the Spirit is directly involved in that. But the Father and the Son are just as involved. Not just one person. All of the Trinity is involved in the distributing of spiritual gifts. Not just one person. How does it work? The Father gives gifts to the Son. The Son gives these gifts to the Spirit. And what does the Spirit do? The Spirit gives gifts to the church according to the will of God. Now we could just close our Bibles and say amen and go home. But there's more in this passage that we need to consider. So we are gifted by God for the good of the church. My problem is when a person sometimes finds out their spiritual gift, it makes them proud. That's not supposed to be. Matter of fact, anything you have, anything you are, you've been given. It doesn't matter who. It doesn't matter how. But you are who you are and what you are because of what you've been given. Sometimes people brag about the fact that I have the gift of teaching or I have the gift of mercy, or I have the gift of administration. These were not given to anyone for their own personal benefit. They are given to a person for the benefit of the church. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11. But each but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he will. So if you have a spiritual gift and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, they go together, then that is for the benefit of the church. To not use that for the benefit of the church is to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And I can tell you from experience, you don't want to do that. And that's a misuse when we are proud of the fact that we've been given a spiritual gift. You say, well, Brother Keith, who is it that confers a spiritual gift today? Well, this text tells us. Notice in the second part of verse 7, all the way through verse 9, the use of the third person singular pronoun, he. In the latter part of verse 7, we see the name of Christ. In verse 8, we see he used three times. In verse 9, is used two times. In verse 10, he is used two times. So the question is, who is the he? Well, we go back to verse 7. Christ is the he of verse 7. And by the rules of grammar, we take the name of Christ and follow it down as we read all the way to verse 10. The he is God. That's the Sunday school answer. Do you remember that when you were a child and the teacher asked a question? And you might not have heard it, but you would raise your hand and the answer was God. It didn't matter what the question was, that was the answer. Well, that's the same case here. That He is God. Not just the Father, not just the Son, not just the Spirit, but all three in one. But I haven't answered the question, have I? Who gives these gifts today? Well, let me answer it. Specifically, Jesus does. Generally, God does. So that puts you right up against the wall, doesn't it? Jesus specifically, God generally. You say, why does Jesus give us the gift? Because he knows all about you. Everything about you. Things you don't even know. And in this text, Paul's emphasis is not on him. People get bound up and caught up with it. His emphasis is not on leading captivity captive, but on the giving of gifts to men. 
We are the recipients of the grace of God, and that is shown to each one by the bestowing of spiritual gifts. Now, maybe up to this point, that's been a little boring for you. Well, it's about to get a little bit better. Number three, consider the objective of spiritual gifts in verse 10. Why would God give us spiritual gifts? Why would he gift us to do anything? Can't we learn how to do things on our own? Well, sure. We have college, trade schools, and all kinds of things to help you learn how to do things. But there are things you cannot learn how to do. When I was in seminary, they never told me how to do a funeral. And I had every preaching class offered. They didn't give me an outline saying, this is the outline you follow when you do a funeral. Ron Corum, who will be here in August, his dad taught me more about that than anyone else. He was my pastor for over 20 years. There were things that I did not learn in seminary. Because they didn't talk about, what do you do when you get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning? Or what do you do when a person comes to your property to curse you out because of something they heard you did? There were no classes on that. So what is the objective of spiritual gifts? What's, basically, basically you could say, what is the purpose of spiritual gifts? Verse 9 says, Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. And most scholars believe this to be the grave or Sheol, as the Old Testament calls it. But he also ascended high above the heaven. Not just heaven, but above the heaven. That's what it says. You say, what is this talking about in connection with spiritual gifts? Well, it's talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. It's talking about all of those. So why is Paul talking about that in the context of spiritual gifts? Well, I had to ask me that, ask myself that question. Why is Paul talking about this now? Well, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection validate his claims to deity. Now, you can follow the life of Christ from his birth all the way till you get to the cross. Stop there. You can argue about all of that, whether he's God or not. There are places he says he is. There are places when a person like the woman at the well said, I know that when Messiah comes, he will show us all things. And what did Jesus say to her? I who speak to you am he. That's it. Jesus claimed to be God. He forgave sin. He accepted worship. Only God can do those things. So, his death, his burial, his resurrection validate his claim. That's it, folks. If you believe in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you've got it all in one thing. The idea is if he did that and no one else can, then that proves without a doubt that he is God. You don't need anything else. There are people who want more though, don't they? Well, his ascension shows clear that he is God because no one else could do that. And all of this was for him, and I'm following the text, was for him to fill all things. To fill all things. Now, I am not a panentheist. You don't know what that is. That's a person that believes everything is God. The tree is God. The mouse is God. The air is God. Everything is God. In other words, he's in everything. I have a problem with that for sure because God is not necessarily everything. But he pervades and he, he influences this whole world. You know, when I watched Star Wars the first time and I heard about the Force, I thought, well, that's a good illustration of God. But the more I thought about it, no, it's not. Because the Force of Star Wars is impersonal. The God of the Bible is personal. He loves. He feels. And many other things. But this, 
His translation to fill all things. Well, I have a problem with that, and I'll show you why. It's the translation, fill all things. It's the verb plerao in the Greek. And if you look it up in a Greek dictionary, it will say the word means to fill completely. And it has many uses. It's not just one idea. That's how words are oftentimes built. That's the etymology of a term. But the idea of plerao was to fill up a hole so that it was level. To fill that indention in the ground. Or it could be used in the banking industry to pay off or fulfill a debt. Uh, to take a vessel that would hold any kind of liquid and fill it up to the brim. To complete a transaction. As a matter of fact, it's even used in the New Testament when Peter and his companions dropped their nets on the other side because Jesus said so and the net became so full that it began to break. In other words, to cram it full. That's the idea. Full of fish. You say, well, Brother Keith, what does it mean, though? Well, we take those ideas and we apply them to this context. And since Paul is talking about the role of the Godhead in dispensing spiritual gifts, so Jesus, having shown his authority over all things by his going down and then coming back, going above the heavens, he, Jesus, dispenses spiritual gifts so that his body might be complete. Full. Now maybe that doesn't affect you. It should. So rather than translate this fill all things, I would translate it complete all things concerning the body of Christ. You say, well, what are the all things? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts given to the church is complete all things. In other words, there's nothing else that needs to be given to the church. You say, well, Brother Keith, sometimes people come from another town or whatever and they join our church. That's right. We're going to find out next week that God adds to the church who he wants. And sometimes he adds people that are gifted in a certain way. Because we need that. Your giftedness, whatever it is, completes the body of Christ. Now what does that say? When you're not here, perhaps the big toe's missing. You say, well, Brother Keith, the church exists even when we're not gathered in worship on Sunday morning. Yes, that's true. But the church certainly exists together on Sunday morning. And remember, this is not because of you, but because of what has been given to you by Jesus himself. He knows you so well that he knows what gift to give you to use to benefit the church. So if you've been given a spiritual gift by Jesus to make Lack of church attendance, a practice, makes the body incomplete. I don't mean missing when you have to, when you're sick. Folks, if you're sick, you don't have to come. If you drive out of state to visit someone that you know, relatives or whoever, you don't have to drive back to come here on Sunday morning. I understand that. But I have been, see, I'm on Facebook. And that's a dangerous place for a pastor to be. You say, why do you say that? Because on Facebook, I found out what some of my church members were doing Sunday morning that weren't here. And they had the audacity to post this. I told Debbie, I said, sometimes I think people think that you and I have dummy written right here across our forehead. But it makes the body incomplete. So look around you. There are people who are not here. There are people who haven't been here 
in a long time. You want to know how long that long time is? Talk to me afterwards, I'll tell you. A very long time. You say, well, Brother Keith, maybe they're not truly saved. That's a possibility. Some that I know, matter of fact, Ron and Karen, Carolyn Bullinger, that I love dearly because of their health. Last time I talked to Ron, he was in the hospital, and that's been a year ago, and I said I would come and visit him since then. Matter of fact, I put his the combination to his gate, Janice, in my phone so I wouldn't forget it. It's just leaving it open. I'm going to get over there to see him. But Ron was on the search committee that called me here. Lovely person. I just, you can't help but love him. And I remember he said something when the church or the leader, the team interviewed me, the search committee interviewed me right over in the fellowship hall. He told me with tears in his eyes, Brother Keith, if this church doesn't do something, it's going to die. We ain't dead yet, folks. And it's all because of how God gives the body Christ. Now we're going to talk about the particular gifts that Paul mentioned right here. We're not going to go to 1 Corinthians or Romans, even though we could do that, but the ones that Paul mentions to this church at Ephesus. We're going to talk about those. And they're pretty interesting. The first one, most of you will never have to worry about. That I'm going to talk about anyway. Now there's apostles, there's pastors, teachers, there's and so forth and all of that. We'll get to that in time. But my question to you, because taking what we have talked about this morning, an introduction to spiritual gifts, let me ask you something. Maybe you've never asked yourself this question. How do I fit into the body of Christ? I'm not asking you if you're the eye or the ear. That's just, that's not the issue. Every part is important. Because I can tell you, I have had gout several times in my big toe, and I didn't know what it was. I thought I'd been out in the yard barefooted and something bit me. Well, it wasn't that. It's very painful, but not only that, you got to be careful. Because you don't want to put any weight on that toe, the one that gives you balance. Folks, you need that big toe. Now, there are certain things that we can, we can get rid of in our body. I mean, Debbie has had her gallbladder removed, and she's had her, whatever that thing is up there, had that removed too. And you can take, you know, medicine after that so that you don't, you, you haven't lost anything, but it's not fun. She can't eat fried food. That's almost a sin in this part of the world. I see you back there, baby. But how do you fit into the body? Have you ever considered that? Are you exercising your gift or gifts? Maybe you don't know what they are. Personally, I believe, and there's a lot of scholars agree with me on this, or I agree with them, that you have one main gift, but other that are, that are smaller. You don't have just one. I'm often amused when a person tells me what they think their spiritual gift is. This is very amusing. Sometimes their so-called gift is one they made up. You have to be careful about that. I've been told that a spiritual gift is telling people what to do. That's not a spiritual gift. We can all do that. As a matter of fact, if you cut us loose, we probably will. I haven't found that one in the Bible, but I'm still looking. No, there's a gift of administration where one has the supernatural ability to bring order out of chaos. Now, I'm going to show you how that works. We'll talk about that when we get to it, but we'll just show you how that works. Last Saturday, not yesterday, the Saturday before, we had over 200 people here. They all knew what to do and where to go because it had been planned very carefully. And folks, not 
by me. My wife did that with help of a lot of other people. If you don't know by now, my wife has the gift of administration. I came home after being gone one day. I think it was Monday. I went fishing. When I came home, she had organized my desk. Now I don't know where anything is. But it looks good. Administration is being able to take things that you and I would say, nope, I don't want anything to do with that, and organize it, put it together so that it works. Do you see how that's necessary in the church? You say, well, Brother Keith, do you have the gift of administration anywhere in one area of my life? And it's not my sock drawer. It's when I sit down at my computer to put a sermon together. It's organized. As a matter of fact, I've showed Michael how I do this. And it's not his gift either. That's the one area. There's other places you can look at my tool trailer. No, don't look at my tool trailer. I know where everything's at. You don't need to know that. No, there's a gift of administration. And that has a great many applications in the church. There are people in this church beside my wife who has this gift. I don't have it. I really don't want it. But I look to those who do have it. And depend upon them. Not everyone has the gift of teaching. I've heard people tell me there's no way I could stand before a group of people and do what you do. Well, at one time, I couldn't either. You say, well, what about the gift of teaching? Well, I believe I have the gift of teaching because if you come on Sunday night and I stand right down there with that little podium in front of me and I have a lesson that I have went over and studied out of Scripture Seldom do I go by it because it's like the Lord says, you don't need to worry about that. I'll give you what you need. And he has already. You say, well, why don't you do that on Sunday morning? Because I believe God can speak to you in the study just as well as he can up here. Not everyone has the gift of teaching. I believe teaching and the gift of prophecy go hand in hand. We're going to talk about those in the coming days. But the thing is, folks, are you fulfilling your part in the body of Christ? Not necessarily a local church, but the church all over the world. If you aren't, if you haven't, I would ask you to do this. Begin asking the Lord what He would have you do in His church. And be willing to do what he said. The church will benefit from what you do. I've talked about him from the pulpit before. Richard Graham is a friend of mine. Lived down in Hillsborough County. He was, uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. And Richard and I became good friends. He married a, a lady from Korea. And uh, we always got along very well with their family, ate with them several times, but Richard was the custodian in our church. A very conscientious person. And if you ask me what was Richard's spiritual gift from observing him over a period of many years, I would say his gift is the gift of service. In other words, he did his job very well and didn't want any recognition for it. As a matter of fact, he would get very embarrassed if you tried to recognize him. A lady came into the church one day, and after going to the women's restroom, she fussed, said, there's, there's gum on the floor of the women's restroom. Gum. You know, the stuff you chew that you don't swallow. I just want to make sure you knew what I was talking about. Well... I said to myself when I heard her say that, 
Why didn't you get it up? She had the gift of telling people what to do. Well, you know, that day after everybody left, Richard went in the women's restroom and got that gum up. Never said a word. But for some reason, the gum strangely disappeared. And it's been said, and I think it's true in the church also, that there's no limit to what can be done if you don't care who gets the credit. As a matter of fact, if he gets the credit, that's good enough for me. What's your place in the body? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage. I realize it's an introduction, but it brings things to our minds that are very important. That God the Father, in eternity past, planned to give to His Son gifts that He would give to His Spirit to one day bestow upon men and women just like us. And Father, if we're born again, if we're truly walking with the Lord, every one of us has been given a gift. And we can find out what that is from Scripture. And I pray we will. Because Lord, the body of Christ, we are the body of Christ on this planet. He's not here now. We are. We're supposed to be His hands and feet. Doing what He did. So help us fulfill our calling. Thank you for this passage again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.